Ladies and gentlemen, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. After years of anticipation, months of preparation, the time has finally come to cast your vote. Will it be JavaScript? Will it be TypeScript? Or will it be both? You decide. RavenDB stores data as JSON documents, so the entire object graph is directly represented in the TypeScript and JavaScript ecosystem. With no need to handle the hassle of impotence mismatch, RavenDB can take a JavaScript object and send it to your database as is. With less friction between your application and your database, you can work with objects organically. This saves you development time and increases performance as your database returns the same data sets it would with a relational database, but requiring far less cost, time, and effort. The complexity of working with these two languages becomes much simpler. Today, RavenDB CEO Oren Amy shows you how easy it is to work with both JavaScript and TypeScript in RavenDB and demonstrate the merits of each for your next application. Feel free to ask questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and Oren will be happy to answer them throughout the session. Enjoy your presentation, and here's Oren. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me for uh, this webinar. I have to start by saying that I'm not a TypeScript or JavaScript developer. For the past uh, over two decades, I've been apparently uh, using primarily .NET, some C, C++, and those type of languages. If you want me to write code in Visual Basic, I have the expertise to do, the, to do that. While preparing for this webinar, I realized that I very much am not a JavaScript developer or no developer, or however much you want to uh, call that. That said, I think that uh, the flexibility and the ease of use of the system makes for some really interesting, uh, really interesting uh, environment. Even if for me, it's who took my C Sharp compiler away. So let's talk about why do you want to even use JavaScript or TypeScript for your application? And again, I might have mentioned 20 years. This is the first time that I wrote JavaScript on the server side. If you don't know what this is, this is ASP. It is ASP classic active service pages. Uh, around 97, 98, that was the height of popularity. We also used to have server side and client side scripting. The server side was typically written in VB, VB script, and the client side in JavaScript. You could write in VB script on the uh, client side as well if you if the client was uh, Explorer, Internet Explorer. And that concludes our history lesson for the day. I will grab my walking stick on the way out. But uh, JavaScript is really everywhere today. Server side, client side, there is the WASM that allows you to do all sorts of crazy stuff. But the interesting about it is that this is literally a, a, a language that was developed in a week by someone who just needed something working. So when you compare that to uh, the success of many other languages that had a lot more design and thought behind them, it's really funny to see uh, how we got there. And with Node conquering the server world and making sure that uh, the cost of being a server application has dropped down so significantly, that means that um, JavaScript is now uh, one of the preferred languages for rapid application development. And that leads us to some serious uh, implications. Because when we're talking about JavaScript, the idea that you can run it on the client side, on the server side, you run it on the command line, whatever you want, it makes things a lot easier. And uh, at the same time, it means that you don't need to remember 10 different languages. Or uh, I remember when moving between uh, VB on the server side and uh, JavaScript on the client side, the semicolon was my enemy because I kept entering that. So that's a minor cognitive note, but the fact that you can look at the uh, same code in both, both environments and see the same thing is huge. At the same time, JavaScript was designed in a week. And there are quite a lot of things, even after multiple iteration additions, that JavaScript just doesn't do very well. 
and the lack of types is one of the primary issues here. And there is also this thing, and I'm sure that you're familiar with the is even and its friend in the uh, uh, modules directory. And I think that the node modules directory is a crime committed against uh, disk everywhere, but we leave that aside for now. The key interesting about JavaScript and TypeScript is that the, the, the rapid nature, the fact that you can uh, start working and get things done immediately. Now, this is impact on what and how you work. And that leads to an interesting observation about how you're going to build your application, because you're going to need to persist data. And as you can see, persistent data in some cases can take the majority of time in the application, especially as the complexity of the application grows more and more. So let's talk about the application that you're writing. And the typical runtime for a JavaScript application today is Node.js. There are some competing runtimes, but we'll go with Node because that's the by far the most common thing. The uh, primary advantage of Node is the fact that it has only async IO, which means that a single uh, Node instance can handle a lot of flow at the same time because most of the uh, JavaScript application work is just massaging data to and from some backend system. And the primary reason that you want to do that is to reduce the development time. And you keep, you're going to keep hearing me repeating that over and over again because that's one of the most important things. That's why we're here because we want to reduce the amount of work that uh, we have to do. Now, let's talk about the issue. And the issue is that people use relational databases when they're using Node. And I just can't really understand why you, you would want to do that. I mean, JSON literally stands for JavaScript object notation. There is one-to-one -one mapping between a JSON object and a JavaScript object because they're one in the same. To be fair, there are, there are some differences. If you really, really try, you get to the point where, oh, this is a valid JSON, which is not a valid uh, a, a JavaScript or vice versa, but those are way out there in the edge. But people still use relational databases to read application. And that leads to some interesting problems. What are you going to do with a relational database when you're building node application? So I went to the best resource that I have for code and went to GitHub. And I tried to find a complex, non-trivial, a complex TypeScript application. And I found this guy. Now, this is a hospital management system for a, a, a hospital in Congo. You can see, this is where I found it. Just Look at this, and I intentionally cropped a lot because there is quite a lot of stuff here that is uh, honestly give me uh, flashbacks to unpleasant times. And the problem here is that you have to deal with 18 joints to get the data back. And you have to pay all of the usual cost with a high, a, with a, a high mental overhead of what is going on with this query? Try to imagine yourself as the poor database who accepts this query. And now need to figure out what to do with that. And honestly, I build databases for a living. I don't want to handle that. Also, for fun, you can see that we have interesting things like this. We have SQL injection and a whole bunch of other stuff that you probably don't want in your database. But even ignoring that, one of the primary issues here is the complexity of the system. You now take in, and let's just count the number of a uh, number of tables that we have: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, just in the small segment that we have visible here, we have eleven tables, and they have apparently quite complex association with one another. And now I have to tell that and show that to the user. And this is not a fast query. 
Now, in bigger system, you're going to have lots of them, and now you're starting to spend a lot of time just massaging the database, taking the data from the database in one format, producing that in the format that you want, and then moving on. On the other hand, you can just use documents. And documents in RevenDB, I have a one-to-one -one mapping with the, uh, with the documents in your instance. So you get to use native object, you don't have the impedance mismatch, and the mental hold on head is minimum to none. Now, there is an important observation to make here. In your domain model, you can have entities that are a, a highly connected. For example, you may have user that has a list of orders and orders uh, uh, holds reference to the user th and things like that. You cannot do that, or you can sort of do that, but you probably shouldn't do that in RevenDB. You want to have clear boundaries inside your domain. This is called domain-driven design. It's something called the aggregate root pattern. I've spoke about this in the past, I think that I have uh, another webinar that is specifically going to talk about domain modeling uh, in the next few weeks as well. But let's see what we have here. And this is taken from this application. And you can see the two options. Here is books, users, the date that a user bought a book, and the date that a user requesting a specific book. And this is more or less how it looks. Notice that in this case, the type of the object that we have is fairly trivial. There is no complexity here. So we can map it as a one-to-one -one mapping. And in fact, because we're using a non-async operations, the RevenDB version is actually longer. When, once we, we're going to move to use sync await in a bit, but it would still be a store call and a save changes where we, we have just the execute query. It's not really that interesting, but the interesting thing here is that what happened when we start working with more complex operations? What happened if I need to create a user and I need to uh, maybe uh, choose the types of topics that a particular user is interested in. Now I have multiple uh, uh, tables, and that means that I now have to deal with, okay, let's create a transaction, let's create an, uh, the insert, updates, all of those become very manual and awkward operation. You can use an ORM, Object Relational Mapper, to manage that. And as someone who has spent years of their life building ORMs, I can tell you that this is great until the point where you're actually going to have to unveil what's going on behind the scenes when you're going to have to do that in order to get appropriate performance and uh, behavior of the system. Now, let's talk about how we're going to model the, the system. The idea here is that we have uh, books and we want to handle borrowing of books. So one of the ways that we can uh, model the data is directly inside the root document. And you can see here, for example, that uh, I currently have this book borrowed, and that's fine. Now, I'm going to touch just a little bit about domain modeling because this is really important. And when you're using Node, this is one of the things that you have to remember because the way that you model your object is typically directly how you model the data inside the database. So if you have, so in this case, we have the notion of embedded data. And that works great as long as this is the list of currently borrowed books. Why is that? Because the list of quality board books that I have is relatively small. I have five, 10, 20 board books at any given point in time. It makes sense to put it directly inside the user document because this is what I'm always going to show. 
a large a, a part of the way that I'm thinking that, that I'm thinking about the data in this in this sort of application is that I want to model it as closely as possible to the way that the user is actually a, a thinking, to the way that the user has built their system. Uh, oh, sorry, not the, not the user build the system. The user is using the system. So in some cases, it means almost one-to-one -one mapping from the user interface to our own code. Now, let's see what happens if I'm going slightly longer than that. So when I'm using a relational database, I would have an issue state, and that can be of any uh, size that I want. The amount of books that the user has bought can, and we have the whole history. This is great. If I'm using this as the history inside the user, that's not so great. This is the part where I need to think about how do I model and work with the data. For example, assume that I'm borrowing three, three books a week. After a few years, I'm going to end up with a very, very big document. That's probably not a good idea. And that's actually a really bad idea because what happened is that we are going to give our worst users the uh, the worst. The, sorry, we're going to give the most important users, the people who come to the uh, library every day and exchange book, and they are uh, the biggest fun and everything. They're going to get the worst experience because if I'm coming to the library twice a year. I'm going to have a very thin document. I'm going to be uh, to be able to operate on that very easily. If I come into the library twice a day, then the more that I come, the slow things become. So we need to figure out how to handle something like that. There are two common ways of managing that. One of them is to have a document per entry, and the second is to have some sort of a grouping by range. And a lot of that depends on how do we work with the data. So let's think about that. Here is an example of the list of times a particular user borrowed a book. And you can see that we allow the book to be borrowed multiple times. Apparently, this is a pretty good book. And uh, here is the other side where we have, okay, here all of the books that were bought by this user for 2020. Now, what's the difference between these two options? In this case, we are probably going to have far fewer number of documents. And uh, if I want to work with those items independently, I have to touch all of this. This is great, and in some cases, I might want to narrow it down to a month range. If what I mostly care about this is to show it, render it, and manage that as a whole unit. A good example of that might be in a bank account where I'm looking at my transactions, but I'm lo not looking at each individual transaction. I'm looking at this, the whole state, the monthly statement. And that's how I'm operating over the, the data. On the other hand, if I have a lot of work on an individual operation, individual transaction, I might want to manage it this way. For example, let's assume that uh, I'm, I'm, my library also have a lot of options that allows me to write reviews and comments and all bunch of other stuff. In many cases, those would go and sit here underneath this location. So now this becomes something for richer. Another example might be if I want to do something per this. A good example uh, in the model might be if I'm uh, consider a car rental. I may rent the same car multiple times, but she, each rental is an independent event. So a lot of that uh, depends on how you model the data and how you think about the data. The good thing about that is that there is a one-to-one -one mapping. Now, I told you today that uh, we're going to make a choice between JavaScript and TypeScript. And to be honest, the strongest possible combination that I have is that 
if you can have a compiler check up after you, do that. And the more the compiler can do, the better things are. And that's because a, a, a bug that is caught in a, at runtime is much, much more expensive than a bug that was caught during the compilation time. As now, one of the nice or not so nice issue is that uh, with JavaScript, until you execute a function, you have no idea if this is even valid. I mean, the code has to be parsed, but it may be at an answer. And a uh, type slip will just stop you immediately. That makes things a lot easier. More importantly is that type slip is a strongly type language with some caveat around that, but it's strongly type, which means that it can actually do quite a lot. Now, before, so I'm going to mostly do demos with a uh, TypeScript. And worry well, you not, know, I know that I'm speaking a lot, but the whole idea is that I want to give you as much time as possible looking at code and not listening, listening to this, uh, uh, not listening to me speaking. So the last thing is that there are two ways to model data in TypeScript. You can use classes or types. We need the runtime information. We need to be able to, to show this. Because of that, we want to use classes, not types. Otherwise, we're going to be uh, working with untyped data. Okay. Now let's go here. So what I have here is a list of books. I actually taken this from the Gutenberg uh, project. And what is the title of this book? Oh, I actually read this one. It's a pretty good one. Uh, so you can see what the structure of the data like. I've taken this one specifically because it's full of pretty dirty data. What do you mean by that? I mean that the uh, structure of documents is different from one to, an, to the next. It means that the, uh, a lot of that was manually entered. So you can see exactly how uh, we are working with interesting uh, data sets. Now, let's go and I'm going to run in I'm going to run this code. And this is basically, I had uh, to do this. Add RevenDB to the package JSON. Import and initialize. And here are some classes that I have. And let's look at what is probably the most obvious option that I have. And I'm basically going to run and rerun the code. And every time that we have something, you can see the, the, the change. So now we can see something really interesting. So what's, what is this? This is a book. You can see it's an instance of a book. And we have it directly in our hand. We can do whatever we want with that. Notice that there is, there is this thing, but I know that I got it here. I mean, it's right here. And I can go here and look at this in the database. It is. Why can't I write this code? And the answer is very simple. This is a book. It is limited to only doing book stuff. Uh, sorry. I think I also need to do this. Why are you doing this to me? Let's do 
and I think that would work. Here we go. So what happened here is that we ran into one of the first issues that we have with a TypeScript versus JavaScript. JavaScript basically says, okay, look, everything, everything goes. All of the objects are basically just dictionaries, even arrays are dictionaries, and you can have fun with that. Makes sense. It works. But uh, TypeScript says, no, 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 no. There are types. You have to work with them. And book does not have a field called Wikipedia. So we can't work on that. And by the way, it makes sense that we don't have a, a book called Wikipedia because let's find something else. Because here we don't have it at all. In other cases, we have fields that don't exist. Uh, for example, I keep saying, I keep getting to Wikipedia stuff. Let's try. Here we go. So here we have three different fields that don't exist. Now, notice that there is absolutely zero issue with them. I can. And. Okay. There is a way of doing that. I don't recall how to uh, uh, how to do it right now, but there is a way to say, oh yeah, I know, still want to do this. But that's basically the same thing. I have to explicitly tell TypeScript, I want to get this. But notice that while I'm doing that, I get quite a lot of benefits from the system. I get type checking, uh, intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is about as simple a, uh, oh yes, uh, David is saying I have strict type checking in the TSJSON. Uh, uh, where is, oh yeah. Okay, I can disable this and then it would work. Or oh, something like that. Anyway, so the key here is that I have the options of working how I want, both typed and untyped. And at the same time, we have to take this a little bit further. Let's talk about how I'm going to work with bore in a book. And this is the code that I'm going to run to bore a book. And let's see what we have. So this is the bored book. Let's go see that. So Couple of interesting things to note. This belongs to the Boros collection. We add some additional metadata that uh, uh, we, we have some additional metadata that we use in order to understand what are the types. So for example, date is a date. Uh, if we had more complex things, for example, uh, Look at this. Now you can see we are telling the uh, the caller we're, we're storing this. Why do we need that? This is because in general TypeScript is removing the types at runtime, so we have to explicitly remember them. So this is basically how we're doing that. Now, this is really strange. 
this looks like a really, really annoying way of doing this. And unfortunately, this is the TypeScript way of creating a new object of a particular type with setting of the properties. Uh, if we're using something like this, on the other hand, we're going to be, when we have a constructor, we're going to have much easier time. Now this saved and we can see a new recommendation. Here we go. Now, what I've done so far is mostly crowd operations, mostly relatively simple things, nothing to really write home about. But it shows the, uh, the ability of the platform. Now, let's see what happened when I want to do something that's more interesting. You can see that they have a recommendation, but the recommendation is somewhere elsewhere. I'm going to do this and save that. Now, what is this thing? Because it looks like I'm going to, uh, I'm sending styles to this book because it's such a great book. And let's see what we have here. Here are some styles. Let's give it another style. And a few seconds, here we go. So here's a good example of using counters from TypeScript. And in this case, this is cheating. This is basically just a, a string, the name of the counter that we increment. But it's a very easy way of managing things in this manner. Now, I can also do this in conjunction. So I can do this. Uh, and let's see what exactly this did, aside from incrementing this value. I'm going to go to Traffic Watch. And let's see. Here is a single transaction that modifies both of them. So we have the ability to manage transactions very easily without really thinking about that, etc. Now, so given that we have done some basic card operations, let's see what we do next. Let's find all of the books about Tarza. And the couple of things that are interesting here. First of all, pardon my, the way that I'm trying to get appropriate uh, format in here. I'm pretty sure there are better ways of doing that, but whatever. You can see that I'm actually doing full text search of the data as it is as easily as this. And I'm operating over this data with is. Uh, here's, uh, here's the data, here's everything that I need to do. I'm pretty done. By the way, you might notice that I don't have much to say here. That's quite intentional. You're not expected to have to dig deep to really think about how to use the API. You're just going to use that. <coughs> I do want to note this guy. There, we, we are repeating information here, which is very strange, but the basic idea goes like this. If I'm not going to specify that, I'm going to have a book of objects. So I wouldn't be able to handle that. So this is, but at the same time, this is compile time information only. At the same time, I need to pass to the query, what object am I going to run? Unfortunately, I'm unable to use this T at the indexing, uh, at the uh, runtime, so I have to pass it directly. Otherwise, I don't know what collection or what index I'm going to query. And here are the results. Finally, let's look at something more complex. And what we see here is that I'm asking a question. And, it's, and what I'm asking is, 
how many books do I have that belong to the science fiction subject? And this is actually quite interesting. Let's look at what we have here. This is, this is the query that was generated. Let's look at that in depth. This is interesting. Why do we have this? Because this is a notation that we have to understand because a book may belong to multiple subjects. By the way, he is apparently a very prolific writer. Uh, I wonder if this is also a Tarzan movie. A Tarzan, sorry. Um, I don't want to bury myself right now. Uh, if this is also a Tarzan book, I don't remember it. And I read, I think, every book on Tarzan that uh, there is. But anyway, going back here, you can see that this basically says, I want to project and group not on the array of subject, but on the values in the array of subject. And then to compare to this, and then we get the result. Going back to the code, you can see that we start by querying on book and we say, hey, I want you to convert the data from the shape of a book to the shape of a pro of, of projection. This way I can run it like this. This is pretty much it. This is more or less everything that you need to know in order to actually make use of TypeScript or JavaScript instead of OpenDB. The primary challenge that we have to deal with is almost always related to a, almost always related to the modeling concerns that we have. That's why I spent a, a time at the beginning of this webinar discussing this. And I really want to uh, not come up with my own uh, ideas and uh, uh, talk to the air. I would really like to have some feedback. So please, this is your time. Give me questions. Let's talk some code. Give me something to chill off. How do you do X, Y, those sort of things. You can send the questions to the chat. You can send the questions in the, there's also dedicated Q&A thingy. Other option would be wonderful. While I'm waiting for more questions, I wanted to also explore some other avenues that you might want to look at. Etc. Etc. You can now manage and react to changes that happen on uh, the server. The RavenDB behavior is going to allow you to let's let's do something interesting. Let's run this code multiple times. Oh dear God, I have no idea what I just did, but I think it was one. Now, we printed it three times. It's really not that interesting. What is interesting is what happened when we're going to look at this here. That's only just twice. And too much. Okay. Now you can see that we are querying the data. We can also do, let's see if I remember how to do it.
second. Uh, okay, this is embarrassing. I don't remember where we where we put that. Uh, where is that? Okay, can find it. So that's a back insert is obviously quite important, but uh, I was trying to demo caching and I'm not seeing the API here. So we'll leave that for now. Uh, something that's important. Notice that we have the session options. And come on. Here you go, and you can see that you have a whole bunch of options here, things that you get to do. Uh, among them, this is probably the most important. Also, this is the location, I think. But the thing that I want to point right now is this that we have a transaction mode. So you can have, you can specify here transaction mode, a uh, cluster wide and get cluster wide transactions. Other things that makes for really interesting uh, uh, systems is the ability to use subscriptions. And you can get the subscription worker. And on batch, And process that as well. And this is actually something that's pretty cool because um, it allows you to handle processing on the background. And this is this is it is, it is something that it, uh, an administrator or speaker can run in the background to enhance your applications. So you don't need to deploy something a uh, heavyweight or something like that. You just get to run that. And finally, I want to talk about indexes. In particular, you can see that we have these guys. And this allows me to define my own indexes in the system. And indexes in RevenDB allow you to do one of two things. You can write them in link using C Sharp, or you can write them in JavaScript. And that means that you get to do everything in the single language, client or server side, indexing, the whole thing. And uh, we actually have a feature that is coming in the next version of the uh, of the TypeScript API that's going to allow you to run, uh, to, to even do that in a strongly type manner. So you'll be able to write an indexing function here and then it's going to be schlepped to the server and be executed there instead of having to work with strings. And that's it. That's the material that I have. If you have any questions, this is the right time to speak about that. While we are, oh, we have questions already. No, just David saying awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, while I'm waiting for more questions, I would like you to remind you that we have the uh, cloud.revendb.net, which you can see here. Uh, it allows you to set up RevenDB for free. So there is no need to a credit card. You can just spin up a server and start running. And that allows you to just get working with zero effort on the cloud without having to maintain anything. Uh, David is asking a question on subscription limitations. Yes, what is the question on subscription limitations? Uh, something to note while we are doing that, when working in the cloud, one of the things that you care about is the auth options. And the auth option in this case is that you need to provide a certificate. So basically you just provide a certificate here and there are some other options that if you want, but that's about it. Uh, Rethink subscription could only be 8K. Uh, this is a, a question. Okay, you know what? Let's do that. Let's see. 
I want to ask, so let's do a, an example of subscriptions. So I'm going to ask a question on subscriptions. Books, uh, well, let's see. Uh, Uh, okay, let's see the let's see what queries I have here. Okay. No, that's easiest. Yeah, but that's not enough. You want something probably more than this. Uh, here we go, PS, whatever that is. Okay. So, Okay, so that looks that looks good. So uh, PS books. And now here, I'm going to do get subscription book here. PS books. And what you can see here is that there isn't actually any limit to that. So, and this would go on and on and on until we process everything. Let's stop that. Uh, so David is asking, uh, imagine a document which repre represents a material view of some data. By writing to the document and having a subscription on this session, you get a live query. Yes, uh, let's show you how to do that. Uh, let's say that what I care about is, again, going to eBooks. Let's talk about subject. So I'm going to create an index, uh, books by subject. and return count one, no, sorry. Notice that I'm outputting multiple results here. And now, this is how you do the reduce. And I'm using that because it's easier than remembering. X dot subject. Okay. So let's look at this. This is now going to go ahead, process everything. And, oh, something that I forgot. Let's look at the result of this index. Apparently I messed something up. Why did I mess? Yes, because this is subject, not subjects. And Here we go. And swap now. You can see that updating the index causes us to uh, create a side-by-side -side operation. And while we're doing that, you can see that we start in having this. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to create an, a subscription on 
basically just this. And in my code, I'm going to say, okay, let's run this. Now this is going to run for a while. Apparently there are a lot of topics. And the, in the end, let me just resolve that. How many topics do I have? 22,000 topics. Okay, I'm not waiting for that. Uh, I'm going to cheat for a second. This is the last, this is one of the last e-tags that I have in the database. So I'm going to say use latest document, which is good. And now let's run it. And now effectively we told Raven, I want you to put this at the end of the system. And apparently it doesn't want to stop. Okay. So I'm not sure why it did it like that. Uh, but the end result, oh, I think I need to do like this, that would smooth things down. But uh, let's again see, that's the latest documents. So that's okay. And now let's run it and that should work. Okay. Uh, now, the key here, this does not create any document each time. Let's go and update this. Uh, and here, this change, just this to change. So let me just go and fix that. And again, you get to see exactly how this is working and why it's working, etc. So the way that it works is that they have a map reduce on something that generate the uh, subject count, and then I'm subscribing to this sub to, to this, and I'm able to operate on that. This create or modify a document each time. There is mod the uh, 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 create or modify is very important because then you have a much easier time managing change over time. Uh, we also have a question from Matthias. Uh, is there a limit on the number of revisions? Is the data compressed? So the answer is no, there is no limit by default. You can say, hey, do whatever, I want all of the revisions all time. However, you can put a limit either on time or on number of revisions. So in this case, I'm going to have a minimum of 100 revisions, a minimum of four days before something happens. In addition to that, you can specify that you want the revision to be compressed, in which case there would be to a much a, a reduced size of the collection. Okay, more questions. Going once, going twice. Oh, we have uh, David asking a follow up questions. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, assuming you have a doc representing current client state, which is created by MapReduce. Is there a way to get the data, the data just changes? Yeah, you can do that. So in order to do that, we have to combine a few features. So let's look at that. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to enable suggestions. 
uh, revisions, sorry, revisions on the subject count. Now let's go here and modify. Ooh, that's actually a really good book. Uh, let's do, uh, let's do this. Now let's add this back. And let's see what happened. Uh, there's supposed to be something here that I don't see. Oh, because I'm looking in the other direction. No, not seeing it here. Okay. Uh, it might be that I don't have this here. No, it doesn't make sense. Uh, No, I don't have enough changes. Let's try to do this manually and that would probably be easier. Now this create revisions. And now I can go here and ask. And now you're going to get both of them. And that allows you to do something like that. Now, uh, David is also asking about patching. If you want to patch something, let's let's say that I don't like this. So I can do this form books update. Yeah. Now we can do this. Notice that in here, this is JavaScript. Again, something I can just run and modify and work with. So this makes things much easier for me if I want to modify it, modify stuff. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. And Now what this? There are ways of adding libraries. Yes, this is mostly run, uh, but in some cases you might want to do it like here. And in here you can add additional sources and add, there's a good example. You can add additional code and things like that here and then call that from the indexing. Using uh, on the patch, it's less uh, less common, but you can do this. And call this from here. Okay. Now, something that you might want to take into account with subscriptions, for example, what I've shown you was the bare bones. You can do projections. You could just ask, give me the data that I want or do whatever you want here to just get the deltas or something like that. For example, let's do this. Uh, Uh, come on. Uh, uh, let's see if that works. And 
one second. I need to remember what I call that. Count. That's the issue. Here we go. So I think this is where this is what you were aiming for. Okay, uh, we're right on time to close this uh, this webinar. If you have any further questions, feel free to send me an email at oren at revenue.net. And I will see you next time. Thank you very much.